our natural need for refreshment and entertainment can be given over to a greediness and a reprobateness that we were lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, as the scripture says, and reprobate against every good work. So they can become a sinful addiction, but in themselves, it's just natural desires of the flesh to be hungry, sleepy, tired, have affections for your, you know, for your wife, your husband, those type of things, natural desires. The thing is, you don't let sin, passions and desires of the flesh, reign in your mortal body to obey its lust. That's the key here. See, that's Romans, Romans 6, 12 and 13 I'm reading from, if you want to look at that. Romans 6, 12 and 13. Don't let sin, the passions and desires of your flesh, rule your mortal body that you're going to obey its lust. You want to look at pornography. Don't let it obey the lust of wanting to do that. You want to get drunk with the boy. Those, those kind of things. See, God's not going to change your desires by magic like these preachers are telling you. They tell you you get saved in your sins, and then somewhere down the road, God's magically going to change your desire to want to go get drunk or look at, look at women or whatever, whatever it is that's got you in bondage. It doesn't happen that way. It happens when you refuse in the Spirit of God, through the exceeding promises, through all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's the only way sin's not going to have dominion over you. The only way. You don't present your members, your body parts, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but you present them to God as being alive from the dead, and your members, your body parts, as instruments of righteousness to God. Not to fornication. Not to filthiness. Not your eyes looking at the lust in the, the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what you do. That's what you do. Otherwise, sin will have dominion over you, and you'll be in death, and you're not going to inherit the kingdom. You are a slave to who you obey, Romans goes on to say in verses 16 and 17 in that same chapter. It's obedience unto righteousness, sin unto death. And again, nobody teaches that. And if they do, they teach it in such a manner they got Christ obeying for you. They don't have you doing anything. Because why? Because it's all been provided for you. See, it's all been that provision that was made. You trust that and it's all... No, no. He's telling you, you... Don't, rent, don't let sin reign. You don't present your members. You do those things. Certainly he's going to, when you make forth the effort, if the Spirit of God is in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal body so that you can overcome these things and continue to overcome them. Certainly. But that's the only way you're going to be set free. The only way. Through the exceeding promises of God through all things that pertain to life and godliness, to be set free from the power of your sinful desires. God's not going to magically change your desires. It, it's just not going to work. I know they show them videos, how God, the, the video of the drunk guy, and, and he's in prison for, for uh, taking somebody's life or having an accident, and daddy comes and pays the fine, and now he's free. And that, that's a picture of salvation. No, it's not. A picture of salvation is that guy reconciling himself with the Father through a purification process called repentance. That's what the Scripture teaches. Then, and only then, is his conduct going to change. And he's truly not going to go out again and, and do what he did and maybe take someone's life in the process. See, God cannot possibly command, command somebody to obey obey him, obey from your heart and, and put to death the passions and desires of the flesh if sin was something dwelling in you. How could you rule over something that's part of your nature? How could you be told? Just like in Cain's case in Genesis 4-7 where sin lies at the door, its desire is for you but you should rule over it. Now, if Cain was not elect and there's no Calvinist preacher today that would say Cain was elect Say, oh, no, he's not elect. Well, then why did God even say that to him if he knew that he couldn't rule over the sin? See, there's no answer to that question under their lying doctrines. See, because it doesn't make any sense. God told him because he had a choice, just like his brother Abel, to offer an acceptable sacrifice to God. He had the choice to rule over it. 
That's the reason. So it would be impossible for you, for Cain, or for anybody, to rule over if it was part of his nature, if he was elected to never be uh, saved, to never be part of the elect. It would be like trying to deny that you're hungry or in pain or you have some inherited disease. It, it, it's impossible, but sin's not an inherited disease. You surely can become second natured, as I said, like by long practice and repetition, but nobody's born with the sin dwelling in them. The sins of the flesh are obvious, the scripture goes on to say in many places, in Galatians 5 and 1 Corinthians 6, Ephesians 5. It doesn't say they're of the birth. The sins are obvious. They're, they're things that people commit. Drunkenness, fornication, homosexuality, for, uh, strife, hatred, bitterness, wrath, all those things that people commit. Moral choices that they make. Not something they were born with. See, the th sins of the flesh, the passions and desires of the flesh, were put off in repentance. When you died with Christ, like Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 6 say, you were buried with him in baptism, raised with him to newness of life. The, the baptism of repentance. Those who have suffered with Christ in his the, the death to sin, followed his example, as Peter talks about in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, have ceased from sin. In chapter 4, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourself also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men. See, not in the mortal body. You're going to be in the mortal body. But for the passions and desires of the flesh, but for the will of God. Like, just like John said, he who does the will of God abides forever. Where did he say that? He said that... After he told him, love not the world or the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, those things are of the world, they're passing away, with, and the world with it, with the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Same thing Peter just said here. For the will of God. So, so great growth in grace is not what the church is telling you it is. That you sin less and less, and you get, uh, as your desires are changed by God, because that never happens. Because you never did the right thing to begin with. See, anybody that never done the right thing to begin with, with a reconciliation with God, will never do the right thing. They'll just keep getting harder and harder in their sins and more and more hypocritical. So it's not sinning less and less. It's growing more and more. By what? By putting off the old man with his perverted use of the passions and desires that he, that he got from long practice and repetition. The old man has to be rendered toothless, stripped of his advantage in repentance. In repentance. If you're still directed by those passions and desires, as Paul pointed out in Romans 6, then you've not entered into newness of life. Because the child of God walks according to the Spirit, producing the fruit of the Spirit unto holiness, leading to eternal life. As he concludes in Romans chapter 6. And then he goes on to tell you the right wage of sin is death. Gift to God's eternal life. Not eternal life for somebody who's living in a sin. Doesn't work like that. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, But uh, in, in, you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him, and have been taught by him. You, you haven't learned about the passions and desires of the flesh. If you can read the verses right before that, it talks about the Gentiles and their, and their lust and their carnality their darkened situation that they were in, their darkened mind. But you haven't learned that from Christ. If you've been taught by him that the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, the old man, that grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. See, it's deceitful lust. It deceives you into thinking that you're going to heaven in your sins and be renewed, how? In the spirit of your mind. Again, back to that spirit within you being renewed by the Holy Spirit of truth guiding you. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. That's growth in grace. There's nothing in there about sinning less and less. Okay, That's talking about growth in grace. That you put off 
You put off these things. They've already been crucified. You put off those passions and desires, those old habits, that old repetition that you had before, that you, whatever it takes, you put off. You should be able, with the Spirit of God dwelling in you, to have everything that pertains to life and godliness within you to assist you in doing this. It shouldn't be. That. My commandments are not grievous. That's what the, the Scripture goes on to say. That he who loves me keeps my commandments, and my commandments are not grievous. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Take my yoke upon you. See, the Scripture doesn't talk about you've got to grit your teeth or white-knuckle your way into the kingdom like these, these people that are living in the flesh think we're saying. It's nothing to do with that. It's not a grievous thing to put off and be renewed in righteousness and true holiness. Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. There's your provision. See, they talk about Christ as the provision. No, he says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust, its passions and desires. That's the key here. Colossians puts it this way in Colossians chapter 3, that therefore put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. This is the children of disobedience.